Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I forgot to thank the organizers when I gave my first lecture, so I give it now. I'm very grateful for having uh, the opportunity to be here and uh, talk about Martin Lerner's work. Um, I, uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, when I got the, the question of, of standing in for Martin Lowe, of course I felt I should really focus on giving, uh, giving some kind of overview of the main points of his, uh, of his uh, contributions. I mean, of course, Martin Lowe has made many other contributions. He's been influential in many other things, in you know, formal topology, uh, non-standard type theory. Um, before he started with type theory, he did, you know, Statistic defi definition of randomness and things like that. He's done very, very many important things, but for us here, the main focus is the, the mm -hmm. as he puts it himself, to clarify the syntax and semantics of constructive mathematics. And in doing that, he's setting up this intuitionistic type theory and giving these kind of primitive meaning explanations for for it. Uh, and then he explains, you know, why is it that this can be used as a programming language. So, uh, <clears throat> what I did in the first lecture was just basically presenting his original uh, 1972 system, which really stands today as today as a very somehow important basic point, a kind of minimal Spartan type theory, which is is, is a good point, a good good thing to know about. In the second lecture, I concentrated on the meaning explanations, and I wanted to uh, wanted to get up to the identity type at, at the end because uh, Simon was then going to start speaking about uh, uh, homotopy type theory, which sort of originates with the identity type in a sense. So now it's time for my third lecture, and I was thinking in the third lecture I can kind of talk about something which has come a little bit after Martin Lowe. And there would be a sort of choice of topics. But one thing I really wanted to say something about is the proof assistant. There are many proof assistants based on dependent type theories of various kinds, but the one we have in Gothenburg is the Agda system. So that was one thing. And I also thought that one possible topic would be to talk about type theory as a general theory of inductive and inductive recursive definitions. Uh, I think I already last time said that the meaning explanations are such that they already suggest that types are inductively generated. Uh, there are other reasons why we can kind of find evidence that from, a, from an early, uh, early point uh, Martin Lowe thought about that, that in that way, and I will come to that to that in a moment. So, so I thought this this would be an important thing to talk about. I had hoped to talk about another thing which I find interesting, and it is the question: What is dependent type theory? And I think you know, I've talked a lot about what is dependent type theory. But what is dependent type theory as a rigorously and elegantly defined mathematical object. It was very interesting when Vladimir Bovodsky entered the field and you know, he started learning about type theory, but one of the things that happened was that he was not so happy about what our community had done. He sort of, one of his main interests during the last few years was to somehow building up the foundations of type theory again by himself. He did new things like B-systems and he, he used uh, old things and sort of elevated them in, the, in, his, in his framework and he wrote a lot about, about that basic question because he wanted it, sort of the meta-theory to be done in some kind of elegant math mathematical way. Um, and I can sort of relate to that myself having read many papers about dependent type theory there are all these little changes, you know, should you have a type label on a lambda, should the judgments be typed or untyped, should we have explicit or implicit substitution, should we have the brown index, etc., etc. One sort of assumes that it actually doesn't matter, they are all equivalent, but it's a little bit unsatisfactory that it is like that. 
So could we do a, can do slightly better by defining somehow dependent type theory up to isomorphism? Uh, and then using categorical methods. So one defines a category of some structure, the initial object of which would be the, in, the, the system defined up to isomorphism. And then everyone who writes a paper about dependent type theory has to somehow make it, make it if you're justified that you're, you're really uh, defining this initial object. So my own, some of my favorite theories are what, you know, what I call the categories with families, which give rise to some categorical cap combinators for dependent types, which one can see as an alternative language definition. Uh, so unfortunately, I, won't, I thought maybe there would be time to talk about this too, but I'll just mention that that's another interesting topic in, you know, in some charismatics, which I think sort of deserves some, a place in the presentation of present-day type theory. So, before I go into the theory of inductive definitions and AGDA, I would like finally to get to 1986, which was the aim of the first lecture, to get to 1986. But I didn't get there in the first lecture, I didn't get there in, in the second lecture either. But now I'm there. Um, so we call it the logical framework version of intuitionistic type theory. It's... Uh, it's structuring the theory in two levels. It's the Martilo calls the, the highest level the theory of types, and then he will have a theory of sets. So the theory of types is a kind of a yeah, meta level for the theory of sets. There are some basic constructions which will be used for, for, for when we define each of the set, you know, like pi, sigma, uh, natural numbers, etc. So we, on the meta level, we have a dependent function type, and we write it like that often, particularly in Agda. It's like a pi type, but we have a different notation because it now serves a different role. We have a universe which we call set. It's like the universe we called U before, but again, it's supposed to be a meta level for the sets that we or types that we defined before. Not they often call the types sets, especially um, uh, yeah, the, at that era when this was defined. One may so one has this this kind of theory of type level, all, also called the logical framework level. One can add this kind of sigma type, which is like sigma, but we have again a different notation. We, we do it like that with a with a times sign, but here b can depend on the x in a. Okay, given that, we can now get a nice uh, formalization of all the formation, introduction, and elimination rules. We just say what, what is the constant called, and what is its type. I will show you in a minute exactly what it looks like. And then there are the equality rules, are like before, represented by equations. It, it's sort of, historically, it was the case that in the early 1980s, people were... Yeah, a number of, of uh, proof assistants have been developed, and everyone felt, you know, we are doing the same kind of groundwork, all of us. We should, we should develop some kind of logical framework, so each special purpose logic can be defined simply on top of this logical framework. And the logical framework should take care of elementary things like variable binding and substitution. Another similar logical framework based on dependent types was independently uh, designed in Edinburgh by Harper, Honsel, and Plotkin. So AIDA is based on this 1986 version of, uh, of type theory. And this slide just says what is... So in a sense, AIDA is a way of defining theories in that logical framework. But it is programming language guide in the sense that it's no longer just a sequence of constants and a sequence of equations, but there are all kinds of features which make, make it possible to structure and read these, these um, uh, theories in a nice way. So, for example, there is a module system. There is a notion of record, which you can see as, as kind of types of, uh, of labeled tuples. 
both the types and the, and the, the tuples themselves are called records. One builds a universe, I mean, a universe hierarchy beginning with the type of sets. Matulev only had the type of sets and didn't want to have a whole infinite hierarchy on that level, and that should be inside the set if you wanted a universe hi hierarchy. But in Aikda there is this universe hierarchy. And one tends to work more on the meta level than Martin Lerb really intended. You can do your own data type declarations of inductive and inductive recursive sets. There is a very convenient um, pattern matching facility for dependent types building on ideas of TREs. Uh, and also there is a termination checking. So the whole way of right defining func terminating functions is much more convenient than than having to reduce uh, such definitions by uh, an application of the elimination rule. Um, it's good to have implicit arguments. You, know, some, you don't want to see all the arguments of a function, maybe. And then there are lots of sort of syntactic sugar, colors, mixed sticks, operations, etc. And most importantly of all is that you build your programs by gradual refinement, you kind of, you start with a question mark, I don't know what it is, I may know what the type is, but I don't know what the program is. And then you gradually build it up, having kind of holes in the program which you need gradually to fill in until, until you have completed the thought. This is a very important feature because it's very difficult to write type correct, dependent type programs or proofs. So here is what the definition of the natural number looks like in the logical framework as represented by Agda. So you see here, so you see here that uh, we have a module, we, so we call this module the n rules. Uh, we uh, declare the data type of natural numbers, so the formation rule for natural numbers is written here after the data keyword, and the introduction rules or constructors come afterwards, after the keyword where, and here are their types. You see that we used, I mean before we had a rule saying that if n is a natural number, then successor of n is a natural number. Here instead of the you know, horizontal rule sign, we have a kind of meta-level implication or meta-level function space. And similarly before when I wrote the type of the recursion combinator, there was a, you know, a rule and there were few premises and a conclusion, but now it's all written as one type where somehow the horizontal rule is there and then it's a sort of current version so each of the premises comes you know, between two, two of these arrows. And then you write the, uh, the uh, uh, equality rules for, for, for the natural numbers like that. Similarly, you can do it for the, for the um, identity type. Here again, it's the so-called identity a la Christine Poulain, where, And here's another feature of Agda that the, uh, the type, identity type, it has three arguments. The underlying set is general identity type for an arbitrary set big A. And then it's got two, two um, um, term arguments, elements of big A. And here Agda lets you put some of the arguments to the left of the arrow and often it's the case that it's useful to put the arguments which you think of as parameters, they are fixed in the definition, to the left of the, of the colon here. So we, de we define here a unary predicate with, with respect to a fixed A to be equal to A. Um, and this also has uh, the consequence that we don't need to write out the para parameter arguments in the <coughs> Uh, as arguments of the, of the constructor for reflexivity. Yeah, and here you have the J elimination rule, which is so important in homotopy type theory. So, what, at the same time as he introduced this logical framework formulation of type theory, he decided to remove these rules. This rule would not even have fitted in, in the style of you know, typing of, of, uh, of constants. Uh, we would have to have a, yeah, it, it. Well, actually, doesn't it? I take, take that back. <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, he decided to take those uh, rooms away, and then he restored the decidability of the judgments. And of course, this was very important for future developments because now um, uh, it was possible when proof assistants were built built for this theory to use to decide. You know, you you have the type checking algorithm of a system like Agda, which decides the typing judgments of this of this kind. And you know, this was. Um, this was the, the way these same systems were, were, were implemented. <coughs> okay, let's get to the, uh, to the question of inductive definitions. So here is a quote which I take to indicate that very early on Martin Leu thought about his type theory as a, theory of in, uh, as a general theory of inductive definitions. Let me read it out. The type N is just a prime example of a type introduced by an ordinary inductive definition. However, it seems preferable to treat this special case rather than to give it a necessarily much more complicated general formulation, which would include sigma plus finite types, natural numbers, and special cases. See Martin Lerner 1971 for a general formulation of inductive definitions in the language of ordinary predicate logic, first order predicate logic. So I think this is clearly the case that he, he had formulated inductive definitions in predicate logic. He thought maybe, I, maybe he could do that for the dependent type theory too. But wisely, better to get the basic rules in place first. And of course, you saw it took between 1972 and 1986 until he got this kind of stable point where he felt now the theory is just as I want it. So it would, yeah, and then afterwards, you know, um, people started developing, well, maybe not exactly afterwards, people started developing the inductive, the theory of inductive facts a little before that, but mostly after, after, after 1986. So let's look at um, his paper on pre uh, inductive definitions in, in predicate logic. So what there was already before that were the theories by Pfefferman of IDN or N inductive definitions as, uh, yeah, as operators in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, on top of predicate logic. Uh, apparently, there have been difficulty proving a normalization theorem for that theory. And Martin Lowe's idea was to reformulate the theorem of inductive definitions using the style of natural deduction. So he now says that in order to give an inductive definition, we give we you know we say that we we want to, to define a number of uh, predicate predicates in, in predicate logic P Q R, and they can be defined by giving some a number of productions. There is what he calls an ordinary production or a finite error production. We say that you know, P is true for little p, provided Q or yeah, uh, little q is true for, for big Q and R is true for big R. That's one possible production. And generalized productions, because I mean, this Pfefferman theory is all about generalized and possibly infinitary uh, uh, inductive definitions. There is the implies production where you say you have an implication in the as premise of the rule, and a for all um, production, where you have a universal quantifier. <coughs> in addition to that, you put some le level of the predicate. Some come before the others. They, he also allows for the possibility that they are mutually defined, some of them. But for example, it says that if we have a formula H of X here to the left of an implication, it must be a formula of lower level, the predicate symbols appearing in it must, must, must be, have lower level them so as to speak, already be defined. So this was what he was referring to, this style here. So when you develop a theory of uh, inductive definitions in, uh, in uh, type theory, so several people have started doing this in the 1980s. There was, for example, a work by uh, a constable and his student, Max Mendler, 
Uh, I was interested in generalizing their work and perhaps also maybe make a variation of their work by but by generalizing to so-called inductive families, what you know what we think about inductive predicates with proof objects. So the idea was simply look at the productions that Martin Loeb had in that paper and give proof objects to them. Just as when we move from, say, the existential quantifier to the sigma, we put a proof object in, and we see what happens. And it somehow, it somehow solves the, the problem. Uh, so you see here, now I've changed notation in the previous page. I used directly the notation that Pyle had in his, uh, in his paper. So now one of the things that happens is that we can unify all the three kinds of productions. Um, so we have we want to you know have an introduction rule for the predicate big P. We call the constructor little c, and we are wondering about the premises. So first there are some premises which of things which were defined before. I like to call them side conditions, and possibly they should be put on the side of the of the rule. Then there are the inductive premises where you use the same, or possibly if you have several, you could also, you could have also from mutually inductive definitions, but, but say that it's, it's the same. Then you have, um, uh, yeah, you, you say that if P of Q, then P of P. Precisely the same pattern that I had in his, in his paper. Under some assumption, so because the, um, you know, the sort of Binding the, the for all and the arrow gets kind of unified into just a, 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 a type a type dependency. So they are both kind of captured by this. And the ordinary productions is simply when we can say H is just a one point type. So it's, it's really, it really doesn't matter. Let's just take some very simple examples. Here we see you know, the inductive type of list, the empty list nil, and adding an element little a in front of a list a s that gives, uh, we should call it cons, you know, cons of a a s with a list. So this will uninductively generate all lists. So with inductive families, we can generate lists of a certain length, we call them vectors. Say that the empty list has, has length zero, and when we add an element to a list, then the length of the list increases by one. And if you recall, I had another definition of the vectors, the n tuples in the first lecture, where it was done by, by a recursive definition, by recursion on n. So you can, do, you can do either. And the big A here is a typical example of a parameter. The W type is important. Um, you have an index type, big A. Yeah, so maybe I should say, what are W types? W types are types of trees of varying and arbitrary, um, yeah, or, or, what was that, uh, arbitrary number of uh, uh, children to an, uh, yeah, yeah, where, where a node can have arbitrary varying and arbitrarily many, many um, uh, children. So for example, if we want to formalize the notion of two, three tree in the, in the data structure theory, so they can have either zero children or two children or three children, then the big A here has to have, there are three options, right? So it must be a three element type. And B is zero, two or three, depending on on what, what element of a, a we take. And uh, yeah, so we build up such, um, uh, such tree, trees in this way. So if we have a family of, of trees, we index by this index type here for, for, a particular, for a particular little a, then we can build the tree which consists of uh, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, you could put all, all these, these uh, subtrees together. This is a whole family of, of subtrees. But 
particularly important application of the W type is the, the uh, Peter Axel's cumulative hierarchy defined inside Martin Luther type theory. Here, here we see it at work again. It's, uh, it's a type of trees where the index type can be an arbitrary small set. So that's why it's, and why it's so very, very versatile. Uh, a notation here is that if we have a family of, of, um, of these iterative sets, then we can put them all together in, in a set. So the set of all M's, such that there is one element of, of each in this family, X and O M. The W type has a special role in the theory of inductive types. In a sense, it is the most general type of the inductive type. So now, from now on, I, I will uh, uh, not discuss inductive families. There is some interest in discussing this, and there are maybe also some things where there is still a debate about the, the level of generality we should have. But, but the principles are more easily understood on the level of inductive types. So on the level of inductive types, the W type is, is um, uh, in some sense the most general inductive type. If you look at the scheme and you change notation a little bit, we see that what I call side condition before is simply this typing of the index type and we have the inductive premise, yeah, it's this, this kind of inductive premise in the W type where you have a family of, 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 of trees. And the only difference is that in the general schema we can allow several side conditions and several uh, inductive, uh, inductive uh, premises. So actually if you have uh, extensional, uh, if you have some, some isomorphisms which are not valid in the intentional type theory of 1986, but if you have function extensionality, then you can actually prove that you can encode all these uh, inductive types built by rules of, of that schema into, into that one, one form. Now, it's time for inductive recursive definition. So I mentioned already uh, several times inductive recursive definitions. The first formal example of an inductive recursive definition is the universe Alataski. In, uh, it appeared in the Bibliopolis book, but actually I found it also in Peter Axel's paper from 1974 where he uh, makes an interpretation of Martin Luther type theory. Sometimes the universe Alataski is maybe better to use for such things. <laughs> So what is the universal Alataski? The universal Russell was the situation where yeah, there was no difference between an element in the universe, like here I call it n hat, it's the, the, L, the, the natural numbers, but in the universal Alataski we have a code for a universe and then we have a decoding function we call t, which maps the code into the type it denotes. And similarly we have, and here is the typing rule saying that n hat is an element of u. And we say that the universe is closed under pi types, so we have a code little pi, which will be used to things built up by little pi, will code uh, types built up by big pi. And now when we make explicit the decoding, we see here that in the typing rule for the pi, the t will occur to the left here in a, in a negative position in the in the uh, in, that, uh, in the premise for the, for the uh, introduction rule, and of course this we usually think is worrying, but it's nevertheless the case that these are somehow constructively uh, well, yeah, uh, good constructive objects. This is what it looks like in Aigda. You see here, in a, here we have somehow linearized the syntax. See, this is the way we, 
write the code for high types, the two arguments, TA here in the negative position, and here I didn't put the, a hat on the end, it was just a little end. And here are the decoding functions. And you see here another feature is that I had the rules for natural numbers and pi in other files, I used them over here, so I have to import them and open them in order to make them available to this file. Um, it happened, yeah, so what is the somehow history of inductive recursive definitions? I think basically the history, well, I think the, the as, you, as usual, probably the history goes back even further, but at least in the, in the context of type theory. The first instances of them, I think, are that they were used in the very first paper by Martin Loeb for uh, generalizing the Tate proof of normalization so that it would work also for dependent types. So he inductive recursively defined the computable types and then the computable terms of those computable types. And these were inductively generated and those were generated by recursion on the way the computable types were built up. He didn't call it induction recursion at the time, he didn't even call it computable type. He said something like, when the, com when the computable terms of that type have been defined. But he still was certainly, because it was actually at the time when he was thinking a lot about constructive model theory, thinking that this is constructively valid. And a, a very similar construction is used in the Frege structure model of Peter Axel uh, for, for type theory, which, you know, or realizability or Perl model is another related term, which the sort of formal counterpart of the, of the meaning explanations. And in Peter Axel's paper, there is also a way to show what they mean in set theoretic terms. Uh, you can also find, yes, and, but then what happened in uh, somehow, I think it was about the early 90s, was that people in, I think it was originally in Uppsala, well, also by Martin Loeb's inspiration, starting with Erik Palmgren, who wanted to have an internal universe hierarchy rather than an external hierarchy and define the next universe operator and then he could have also defined a super universe which is both the universe in the usual sense but it also closed under the next universe operator. And this, then this continued with further work by uh, Michel Atien, Eric Palmin and Griffer and also with Anton Setso who also spent time in Uppsala. Anton had a a kind of type theoretic counterpart of the Mahler, Mahler cardinals in set theory, called the, the Mahler universe. And Eric Palmgren also had another powerful construction called universe hierarchies. And then some the other people found that induction recursion could be used also for more, more somehow everyday businesses. We, we can define fresh lists by simultaneously, fresh lists are a list where all elements are different. So you simultaneously inductively generate the lists and then re by recursion on that uh, decides whether a certain element is fresh with respect to that list. And you can do exactly the same with sorted lists, for example. So when I first worked on general form of inductive definition, I thought that type theory works like this. First we have the basic layer, which is some kind of lambda calculus with dependent types. Then we have a uniform pattern for adding inductive types. And then at the end, we have universes. I thought the universes were a kind of thing by itself. But one day, while refereeing a paper by Nax Mendler on category theoretic semantics of universes, and then Mendler already knew about the work of Pauke and Ratjen, maybe the Zetsos universe, happened yet. So he felt that there was something, to, a general notion to, to capture. Uh, so I looked at that paper and I realized that actually it fits into the schema I, I had for inductive types. With only one small modification and it is that now you simultaneously define a function t by recursion on the elements u. Now you can let, let that t participate in the premises, uh, in, in, the, in the inductive type, because 
the, the intuition is sort of like when you have defined an element of you, then you immediately have access to, to, the, uh, to the result. So you can use it. And this, the negativity is not a, a, real neg a real negativity. I mean, maybe one more thing to say. In the Stuart Allen semantics of inductive recursive types, what you really do is that you inductively generate the graph of T rather than U, and then the U is just you know, the domain of definition of that graph. Okay, so there have been many, many dot to dot to dots so far in this talk. So the question is, can you make, remove all those dot to dot to dots and make it some kind of finite like, axiomatization. I remember meeting uh, Anton Zetzel and Michael Hartian uh, being interested in this thing, but they didn't like the dot dot dots. So the question was, can we remove them so that they are more somehow, again, more mathematically nice objects? And the answer is yes. And it's actually quite simple. Well. Yeah, so now I show you this. Let's see. Can you see? Oh, can I turn this off somehow? You can, yes. Um, on this, well, I have to remember this. Let me see. Isn't it if you press? <laughs> you can, there's one button you just have to press and then it just turns off on the yeah. uh, <laughs> Maybe, can you still see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so again, it's a little tiny bit of category theory that comes to the aid. Uh, <coughs> In category theoretical terms, inductive types are usually captured by initial algebras. So the way what we say then is that we have an endofunctor, I call it F sub sigma here, so for example for natural numbers it would be 1 plus x. Uh, <clears throat> so we get a, so the natural numbers form an initial 1 plus x algebra. What that means is that it's a map from 1 plus yeah, x, in this case, oh yeah, yeah, I, I put a u there because eventually it's going to be a universe, but, but the sort of natural numbers will be a kind of special, construct, special case of a universe. So, uh, so um, uh, yeah, you say that natural numbers are initial because they are initial in the category of 1 plus x algebras. What does that mean? Well, it means that there is an arrow from 1 plus, well, natural numbers to natural numbers, coding out the zero and successor, such that for any other 1 plus x algebra, coded by this phi here, there is a unique uh, morphism, which means that it should two arrows, which makes this diagram commute. So you have to map this also by the by the functor part of, of this 1 plus x functor. And this codes up, this here is the constructor, this here is the iterator, and the commutation of the diagram is the, you know, what Martelow calls the equality rule. So one should note here that this, it's the iterator, but you can get the, the dependent version of, of it by instead considering maps into Sigma, sigma types, because then C is a, you somehow look at the, yeah, the total type, or the, you, you think of the of a C here as being fiber over, over U, and then you can, you can uh, make the map into the sum of all those fibers, and then you can derive the elimination rule really in the dependent way with a little bit of work. Anyway, so this is a diagram which probably is familiar to many of you. But 
the diagram itself, it leaves one question open if you want to have a general theory of inductive types. What are we allowed to put here? What kind of functors do have initial algebras? For example, we don't want algebras with negative occurrences of the variable. So what we now do then is that we build a little universe of signatures. The word signature comes from universal algebra, because you know, in universal algebra, if we have algebra with only finitary operations, it's just a list of numbers. So you can create, the, you know, for a list of numbers, you can create the initial algebra of such things. So natural numbers, we'd have numbers 0 and 1, for example. Um, <clears throat> so here we have a more general notion of signature, because we, in particular we want to capture we want to capture um, uh, generalized inductive definition, infinitary inductive definitions, things like W types. So we have three cases, and we, we build signatures in this sense by, 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 uh, by these three cases. Epsilon here is the base case. It codes the functor which, the constant functor into, into the one element type, or one element set. Sigma adds a new non-inductive premise, and then you, you can make, yeah, so it's easiest to understand what they do by saying here. So you, you have one non-inductive non premise of type A, and now the rest can depend on the, on the variable x here of type A. So you have a whole family of, of um, uh, func functors here, and you take the sigma of all of those. And then you have rho, the rho is for recursive. Then you simply add a recursive premise. And in the case of, um, uh, yeah, in the case we have here, it's just, we just need to know what is the premise here. The, um, yeah, the thing which, uh, you know, we have a whole, fa if it's an ordinary inductive or finitary inductive definition, then this is just x here. But um, if, if uh, it's a generalized inductive definition, a, a can be can be uh, something something else, and then we add all the other the other premises. So, so for example, just to show how this works, we can build up. Uh, some defined codes. We can, for example, encode the identity functor. It has one recursive premise, one ordinary recursive premise. That's what somehow the first, the first line, row one epsilon. It's not exactly x because we need to, to uh, take into account that one arrow x is isomorphic to x. We can build sums of functors. This is of course important because usually we have several constructors, but we can just use, use the sigma type for, for, for that. So you see, so, sums are somehow defined in terms of, of, of sigmas. So now we can uh, build a signature sigma n for natural numbers. epsilon plus id, encoding 1 plus x, or we can build a code for w types. Uh, <clears throat> so it says, you know, first one non-inductive premise, then an inductive premise with uh, uh, hypothesis b of x, depending on x in a, and this is exactly what you get down here. And that's it, and now we have a theory of inductive types, and with a little bit of work you know, we can get the dependent elimination rule. And all is kind of encoded in this little, in this list, little system. It's actually not at all very long. So you can, you can have a very compact formulation of a general theory of inductive types. Now come to, let's come to induction recursion. So I think then that again, I should try to show why this in what sense this is. I should have a white slide. Yeah. 
We try to modify the initial algebra that diagram a little bit. It doesn't really work because category theory is not somehow powerful enough to capture, to capture this notion in a natural way. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, usually when you think about the initial algebra, perhaps you think something like this. We construct the initial object. If we have another algebra, we can make a function into it by iteration. When we have inductive recursive definitions, we should think in the opposite way. We should think that we have some kind of operation here. Now we want to internalize that in some type or set, use, use of sigma. The question we must ask ourselves is which operations can we internalize? But just as we asked ourselves what, what were the f sub sigmas here, we use the g sub sigmas here. So, because I will simplify a little bit, because the most interesting case is when c is the type of set itself, like in the ordinary universe. So let's call this c here, and I will just call this, take away the c here, take away that, so, take away all c's, this is this is a small little c, so I can take it away. <clears throat> so, the question is, what is allowed to write down here, and then how is it internalized? What is different here, right, and what is exactly what makes it inductive recursive, is that, of course, you, the, the domain of the constructor does not does not depend on something that we define by iteration over it. But here it does. That's exactly what simultaneous induction recursion is. It, we, it, we introduce this, this dependence here. So somehow what changes here from initial algebra semantics in the usual way is that this is no longer this, what I've written g sub sigma, it's not really a functor any longer. It's something where the different parts of it behave in slightly different way, ways. Let's look at more in detail what it was. So here on the, on the slide now is roughly the same thing. You know, I say an inductive recursive definition is obtained by reflecting an operation as a constructor. And we, yeah, so it's basically the same thing just uh, written on the slide. Yeah, and here is a special case of set. So now we really have a re reflecting a, uh, an operation returning sets. So like pi, sigma, natural numbers, and so on. And also the higher universes. So again, it's best to look at <coughs> the different things here. So what kind? Th this is. These are. <coughs> so now we have some. Yeah, we have some uh, signatures. Again, here it's a little bit similar because we have a case, a base case. We have a case for adding a side condition. Oops. We have a case for uh, adding a side condition, and we have a case for adding a recursive premise. So the side condition is exactly like before. We just add a side, side condition of an arbitrary type. But in the case where we have some recursion going on, then we have a family of sets here as, as an argument. So you say that it's actually not that complicated. It's just a sequence of such side conditions and recursive premises of that form where we again have some family of sets such as premises, but there can be dependence between the different ones. So maybe it's clearer if we take the code for pi. It looks like that. It looks maybe a little bit formidable in the first few seconds at least. But if you, I shall not read it here except more times, <coughs> saying, well, maybe I should. There are two recursive premises. The first one is an ordinary, you know, there is no hypothesis. The other one is not ordinary, and there it comes from the A here, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is um, uh, quantified over 
this first one, which comes into set. So then you see, if you unfold the definition of that, you get this type, and if you simplify it, you get this, which you see is exactly the, the domain of definition for the pi, the, the pi um, uh, set former. We have had to, you know, before when I gave it in the IDA code, it was curried, here it's uncurried. So now comes the question of how do we, uh, what does now, so we, we now know what operations can we reflect? How are they reflected? What is the type of the constructor reflecting phi? It's called little c sub sigma. So we have to look for each, uh, each signature, what is this expression here. And you see what is somehow it's very similar to this previous picture. It's just that here we, we I mean we have side condition which is exactly like in the previous picture, but here we had a family of sets. Now we have a family of, of elements in the universe. And here we see how we can use this f by applying it to t so that it becomes uh, an, an argument of the, of the family, family sigma here. So you see that if we unfold it again, this definition for pi, we get this kind of expression. And if we simplify it, we get this expression, which is exactly the same. same. So you see that it, it looks very much like the type for pi, but we have just here introduced the t, which is necessary for turning the, the small the element of the universe into into the set. That's more or less it. I haven't, you know, I have not. Um, I have done the GC and I have done the G. There is also something for for this map here, which is needed for the for the equality room. But I think I will not do that because it's somehow more of the same exercise. Yeah, so what remains, I somehow, in order to make it hopefully comprehensible and also get across the message that it's actually not that complicated, uh, I took a simple case. But the rescue is that the rest of it is not so much more complicated. Uh, I chose the, I, cho I chose the the case where C is set, which is, you know, what you maybe with most often, but the induction recursion can go into, the recursive part can go into any type of, any, any type basically. Yeah, not any basic, any type. Uh, you, of course, need to make things a little bit more complicated in order to take care of indexed induction recursion or inductive recursive families. Oops. And what is coded here is only the constructor and the decoder T here, right, the universe, there is a more general principle of universe elimination, which can also be represented by this machinery, which I will tell you why as well. So let me finish by summarizing a little bit the message here about what is intuitionistic type theory. So you can see it in three ways. Either what I showed you in the first lecture, the sort of Spartan intuitionistic type theory with a fixed uh, collection of, of, of type formers, something which could be compared with you know, basic systems of logic like Heitling arithmetic and Heitling arithmetic of higher type, is that plus a little bit more. And as I like to put it, those systems embed very smoothly into into type theory in 1972, and they sort of explain them. And then what the meaning explanations do is that they explain it even more. They explain what you already thought you knew even more. Uh, but it, from the sort of uh, philosophical point of view, it's a limited view of what intuitionistic type theory is. <coughs> The whole machinery has an ideal constructive object which is much better captured 
by seeing it as a general theory of inductive and inductive recursive types. And uh, you know what I just showed you. You can see there are some publications by myself and and Anton Anton Zetso, where this is discussed, of course, with all the formal the formal details in place. So there is a third view of, of type theory, which I think is really the view that Per Martin Loeb has himself, that it is an open theory where you can add things whenever you feel that you understand that they have good meaning explanations. So interestingly, uh, Anton Zetzel has tried to do inductive recursive definitions which fall outside these schemata. He has something called autonomous Mahler universe and pi three reflecting universe. I don't think they are published yet, but they, they, they I think they may exist in ITA code. So, uh, so, uh, and it's so. The picture is a bit similar with the, this in set theory. That yeah, if you can think of some kind of new large cardinal, you can add it to set theory. Set theory is an open framework in a, in a, sim, in a similar way. Um, what about Agda? Well, Agda is, in a sense, an open theory. That's what it feels like because you define new things all the time, data types. But then Agda has two things for slapping your fingers, namely a, a termination checker and a positivity checker. The positivity checker is some kind of approximation of what it means to be a correct inductive recursive type, but I don't think it's, it um, adheres slavishly to our schema. I think it, for example, lets some, some more things through, through, and maybe a few more things, a few things less. It's, it's not documented, it's somehow there in the, in the system. Just. Um, yeah, I think by that, I think I want to conclude. Uh, maybe the very last comment is, of course, that when you add things like that, then the meaning of the meaning explanation really comes to the, you know, to the, uh, to a test. So one should never be think that just because we have meaning explanation, we are sure that our rules are correct. No, no, they just show what it's supposed to mean. It's, it's what's supposed to happen when you derive new conclusions. Then you go to the meaning explanations, you execute your programs, and you see whether what you think happens, happens. And of course, it may very well know, I mean, I said that's a tacit assumption of well-foundedness in the meaning explanations. And when you go on trying to test these, these things, you may well get into some point where you start doubting whether they really are well-founded. Well but you won't know. By that, I think I am done. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Peter. <coughs> yeah, the floor is open for comments, questions. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, it's still open, it, it is open by definition maybe, the definition of what is inductive uh, type. Because uh, it seems uh, there is no limit on what you can uh, define. Uh, no, and that, that's, like, in uh, the, that's in the nature of things, right? Yeah, because uh, the same question is about predicativity, no? Fetterman gave an answer. So here, yeah, no, no it's, it's fundam fundamentally open, right? Inherently open. And another thing is that uh, uh, the categorical formulation would be nice to, to write down the definition, like uh, the dependent type theory, you use categorical semantics to give the definition. Yes, yes. But uh, it would be better to make this uh, inside the, the um, Feferman theories or theories uh, subsystem of uh, second order arithmetics. And I was wondering what is inductive recursion in that uh, framework. Because uh, universities can be built as inductive definitions uh, in the Fesherman's uh, ID1 uh, something. And I uh, was wondering, do you know the correspondence of your... Uh, I mean, I th what I know vaguely 
is that they have, they have, yeah, maybe you, you, you probably know much more about that, but there is developed uh, some kind of theory of universes in the Fermanic framework, right? And there are somehow analogs of the type theoretic universes and the uh, Pfefferman explicit mathematics universes. I, I, that's what I, what I think. I don't know that there is some kind of general schema for induction recursion that we could remember. maybe one could possibly imagine such a thing. Maybe. Um, yeah. uh, I have a question about ACTA. Yeah. Um, if someone tells me they've proven something in ACTA, um, I wonder to what extent this should make me believe that the proof is correct. Um, is it true that I should should ask uh, what exactly uh, was added in, in the sense of this third point? That it's in what what kind of uh, inductive recursive? And the definitions uh, they allow themselves. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is, of course, a point we discussed a lot in Gothenburg that, I mean, ACTA is not really well, a well defined formal system in the sense one usually thinks about it in logic. It's not something where you can find a paper with all the inference rules or something like that. Of course, it's indirectly defined by its implementation, and we don't know whether it, uh, it uh, derives. Uh, any inconsistencies they could now from time to time they find they find bugs in it of course. Yeah. So you but I think one should also understand what the background for this is that yes it could it would have been possible to, to follow for example this theory and try to be very faithful to the theory in the design of the system. The problem is that it is very inconvenient when you try to do some kind of practical programming to reduce everything to elimination rules. And one, especially with Agda, maybe more than with Coke, one has prioritized thinking about it as some kind of practical programming language, not as a sort of very rigid foundation, but as, a, as an experimental tool for, for practicing programming with, with dependent types. We are from time to time thinking of uh, trying to build, have a, define a small core language and try to see whether we could have an Agda where everything is reduced to that. Martin? Yeah, just uh, I also have the same worry as he has, and that's why I I work in what I call the Spartan MLTT fragment of Agda. Yeah. I don't use even W types. So I just use sigma pi n zero one two, and I think that's it. A universe. Yeah, yeah. So it's of course yeah. possible, but you have to impose that discipline yourself, right? Yeah. No, but no, because otherwise you don't know in which type theory you're working. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can claim the uh, chairman's privileges. Because this, this topic there, this induction uh, recursion, so from, from a proof theoretic point of view, that corresponds to some theory which has been called KPM. So basically, it's, it's kind of an extension of um, Kripke Plata except theory. These axioms that describe some kind of model universe, uh, recursively model universe. And that somehow corresponds to this induction recursion. And then, um, and then there's the other thing that Pe what, what Pe Martinov always um, insisted on that somehow Martinov types is an open ended system. Um, but I do not. Um, I do not think really that it's, it is open and in the sense that you will get really much more consistency strengths than beyond that, if you might, maybe if you iterate these ideas. I mean, for instance, to put this in the context of second order arithmetic, this is way, way, way below what's called the pi 1, 2 comprehension, right? So anyway, i just talking about uh, this stuff because I was, I was interested in this. I, I tried to once uh, <coughs> argue that basically this master of type theory, you never get there. Yeah? Basically, there's some kind of boundary here. Where, but anyway, so if, if anybody has um, ideas about this, I'm, I'm happy to hear them. I mean, not now. Or, or anyway, so. Any more so questions? Are you saying that uh, it's not open at this? I don't think so. I mean, of course, if you say I can just make uh, accents up as I please, okay, then you can do lots of things. I mean, following the, the idea is if you follow the spirit, 
this already, I mean, Peter, this already kind of stretches the ideas, I would say, underlying multiple types of to, to some kind of limit. But how much further can you go? I mean, it's, are, are there any, um, so far, undetected principles that you would immediately accept, but you haven't just uh, uh, happened to uh, consider? I mean, that, that's my question. Yes. So do you see this as a limit of the constructive mathematics? Of some sort, yeah. Uh, well. If you add classical logic, then what happens? Sorry? If you add classical logic, yeah. Classical logic. Did you mean to attack to it? Yes. Or then destroy it? Uh, you draw into a predicativity uh, if you add a classical uh, to Martin Love because of the A into Bull that can encode the predicative. Yeah, I mean, and so there is no question. Oh, I mean, of course, I mean, there's, there's an easy way of going beyond that. Just take the interrogative type prop or so. And basically, what you can in, in, incorporate is if you have a universe closed on the prop or several universes, then you get something like negative power set, which then allows you to uh, basically have yeah. a, a, a set theory of the strength of at least some middle, which should transform the levels of some middle. So yeah. if there's a way of going beyond, then um, that's. The question, I don't want to drag this out. The question is, can you go much, much further in the spirit of, say, Martin of Taxi, like what Peter was talking about? He kind of tried to, uh, well, he succeeded in uh, explaining the idea of underlying And can you go way beyond that? And, uh, that is the question. Not that you can come up with some other types that are really powerful, of course. What do you think about this uh, proposed? Uh, Higher inductive types of univariant uh, theory. Yeah, so um, since I did some work on them, I I feel I now understand some of them at least. And for me, I just felt that yes, it's possible to reduce them to the ordinary inductive types. In, you know, we, we I, I and my co-worker we worked in it with limited forms at a lower level, but still. I started seeing some kind of pattern where you basically just reduce them to, uh, well, in inductive families of very various kinds. So, so um, and that, that seems to be possible, at least for these lower ones. I don't know really, because the problem with is when you change framework, when you work in the cubicle type theory, then it's a bit of a different framework, and I'm not sure exactly how inductive definitions work work there, but for simple things on the somehow level one and level two, it seems uh, perfectly fine to uh, to interpret them in some type theory where you have inductive families that na naturally interpreted in that way. I just occurred to me that going beyond also these, uh, because they have been mentioned before, that these uh, uh, Borbotsky's resizing rules are some kind of uh, reoccurrence of uh, Russell's uh, Infamous reducibility. So they, they go, I think they go beyond that, of course. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? No, just the last question that I have always uh, about the proof assistant and the desirability of type checking. Mm -hmm. Next talk will be about Nupel. <laughs> so uh, uh, I wonder uh, you, you addressed this before. So what matters the desirability for you? In the system. So how much how much does the decidability normalization of the systems? <coughs> well, I mean, are so, so you asking me personally? But I think about this. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, a, I mean, especially before the advent of uh, univariant type theory, I was seriously fed up with intentional type theory because I tried to use it for some difficult things. And I, I really had a hard time making the things, uh, the things uh, type check. So, so I started advocating extensional type theory. Okay. Because extend, why should we deny it? If we believe that meaning explanations justify it, why should we deny us, ourselves those truths? I, I more see as decidability as a practical thing. But of course, I also feel that it's a preliminary opinion. I, I would like to think more about that. Okay. Is the preliminary opinion? The preliminary opinion is that mean explanations justify extensional type theory. They do in the sense of with how I have spoken about it and in realizability models. But, but uh, you know, I have somehow some, uh, I have some 
special way of thinking about uh, meaning explanation in terms of tests and games and stuff like that, which may, may give a different view of it. Anyway. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Peter.